Good afternoon and welcome to HealthSystemCIO.com's all-star panel on Embracing Open Notes, a webinar tweet chat combo from HealthSystemCIO.com produced in partnership with Chime. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com and I'll be your webinar moderator today. We do have a tweet chat going on, an associated tweet chat is hosted by our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media, Kate Gamble. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat or you can view the, the, uh, the tweet chat in the Media Viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Other WebEx panels we're going to use today will be our Q&A panel, which you can use to <clears throat> submit any questions that, you, that come to mind. Send them in as they occur to you and leave the default set to all panelists. We're also going to do a few poll questions today, and your polling panel will open um, when we get to those. And if you can go ahead and answer those, they'd be great, and we'll discuss them during the event. And you can download the deck by using the URL on your screen. The URL is at the bottom of all our slides, and it will also be going out in the chat box during the event. So plenty of chances to get the deck. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to have our main panel discussion. We're going to go about 30 minutes with Dr. C.T. Lin, CMIO at UC Health in Colorado, and also Dr. Homer Chin, co-director of Northwest Open Notes Consortium and associate with Open Notes at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So without any further delay, we're going to jump right into our discussion. Let's start with CT. Um, CT, can you give us an overview of UC Health, please? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on the call. Uh, UC Health is a, I think we're up to seven hospitals now, seven hospital and 400 clinic uh, health system in uh, Colorado. Uh, we're based uh, centrally in Denver, but uh, uh, extend up into Wyoming and down uh, to the southern part of the state. Um, and we've been on uh, the electronic health record for about a decade and our most recent uh, electronic health record for about five years. Very good. Homer? Um, yeah, so my name is Homer Chin, and um, <clears throat> actually until about two years ago, I was the CMIO at Kaiser Permanente Northwest, and I can tell you about uh, Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente Northwest is one of uh, six Kaiser Permanente regions. It has about 550,000 uh, members, and um, they, uh, we were early pioneers of the electronic medical record. In fact, we implemented um, ep EPIC in the outpatient arena um, in the last century. <laughs> in 1994, we implemented uh, EPIC, and by 1997, we had deployed it completely uh, throughout the organization. So we've really been a pioneer in this area, and we um, implemented our patient portal in 1998. So we've had a lot of experience with, uh, with patient portals. Um, I retired about uh, two years ago from that position, and I've been working uh, with Open Notes ever since. Very good. All right. Um, let's uh, stick with you, Homer. Uh, everyone's got a lot on their plate, a lot of things to do, a lot of priorities, uh, fighting for time and budgeting resources and all that. So why pursue Open Notes now? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. You know, physicians in general have been challenged by the electronic health record, and one of the questions is this just one additional thing that they have to uh, deal with. And so uh, that was a question that was uh, studied in a research project uh, back in, I believe it was uh, uh, 2010. <clears throat> and what they found is that uh, there was no change in uh, physician workload and there were significant benefits. So there's benefits in terms of patient engagement, um, uh, potential uh, benefits in, in other areas as well, though we don't have uh, hard and fast data. Um, around physician work life, there's some evidence now that it actually helps physician work life. It, uh, it improves their engagement with their patients and it actually improves physician morale as far as we can tell. And so we're actively studying that. But I think one of the things about this is that <clears throat> Open Notes has uh, proven significant benefits, and we can't uh, really say that for other parts of the electronic health record. And so uh, 
it's important to do some things with uh, proven benefits. And so I would say that's one of the one of the big reasons to engage uh, in in this initiative. So it actually, in your opinion, it can actually enhance the electronic health record in the sense of, you know, everyone uses the word optimization. So we put it in and now we want to optimize it. We want to make this thing valuable. So this right. is, in your opinion, Open Notes is one of those things that can help you uh, get satisfaction and sort of the bang for your buck out of your EHR. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, one, one of the um, things is that you know, this is sort of an unanticipated functionality. When folks implemented the electronic health record, it was mainly to improve physician-to-physician -physician communication. But once you have it electronically and available to other physicians, you can also make it available to other patients, which wasn't one of the sort of anticipated uses of the electronic health record, but it makes a, a huge difference. And it's about time we engaged patients um, in, in this way. Very good. CT, your thoughts on why now with everything else going on? Sure. So I, um, I should mention that we've been uh, open notes system-wide throughout all of our uh, 400 clinics since about May of 2016. But from a research perspective, I've been working with open notes in clinics and studying the effects of it since about 2001. Um, even prior to when we called it Open Notes back in 2010. Um, I think from a, um, an initiative's perspective and why now, um, and with so much else to do, I think it's a large part of the triple aim, right? So if we're talking about trying to improve patient satisfaction and engagement, we're trying to improve quality, we're trying to reduce cost, at least two, and in some, depending on what re research uh, you, you look at, um, all three are addressed by having uh, patient portals and being as transparent as possible. Patient satisfaction with the connection with their doctor is quite powerful. We have a number of stories of how patients would say, well, you know, my doc didn't have much time with me today, we only spent about 10 or 15 minutes, but I went home and I read the comprehensive note he wrote about me, and boy, my doctor works really hard for me. I didn't know that. And furthermore, when I have my doctor's note, I feel like I'm engaged in my own health care if I go to the next doctor who's not part of the same health system. I own my record. I can take that to the next doctor and show them. I feel like I'm participating. So there's some really great connections there. We also know that there's research indicating that patients renew their prescriptions on a more regular basis. There's improved uh, adherence to therapy with medications and with overall treatment. And who doesn't want that with the improved quality metrics? In so I think at least two out of the three, there's strong evidence that open notes are an important uh, way of going forward. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, CT, let's, let's stick with you here. Um, how can proponents best make a case to the rest of the organization that the effort of instituting open notes is worthwhile and who typically needs to be convinced? So the idea here is that the CIO or whoever's listening to this call is on board and excited and wants to make this happen. So how do they go about getting that buy-in to make it happen? So I can uh, do this in brief. I, I can tell you that I've done it wrong uh, a number of times, which is why it's been a 15-year journey from the original research we did back in 2001 until now to be able to say that we are system-wide open notes. It takes a bit of convincing. Um, the, the way that we've managed health records in the past has been this is the purview of the organization, the purview of the doctor, and we don't need to share this with the patient. It's a prevailing uh, a culture that you have to overcome. I think from the C-suite and talking about where the country's going, the CEO, the CIO, CNO, and so forth, they see the benefits of increased transparency. It's the frontline uh, working doctor who you have to convince. And so this is sort of a um, one-on-one -on -one conversation that I ended up having to have with pretty much all of our clinic medical directors, of which we have you know, hundreds, uh, dozens who were uh, high-level leaders and then uh, hundreds of clinic leaders one at a time talking about, look, here's the research. Here are your theoretical fears, and here are the actual research findings that show that, no, the, the phones don't ring off the hook, the, the email boxes don't fill up, uh, you don't watch, uh, what is it, House on Wednesday and then Thursday have hundreds of messages from what they saw uh, because mm -hmm. they're sending messages and they're reading their notes and they have lots of questions about, uh, you know, how you worded things. 
it does not occur. Um, so you get benefits, and then once you get over the fear of this is not going to bring the house down, people then get on board if you have research data to show them. So I, I find it's the chief medical officer, it's the clinic directors, it's the frontline doctors who you have to get into small conversations and, and convince them. Uh, CT, just as a follow-up, um, is it absolutely necessary that those conversations be physician to physician? So a physician that is bought in or the CMIO who's leading it, who is a physician, speaking to these physicians, or do physicians listen to non-physicians or IT folks or even CIOs bringing this message? I think uh, I think that's a softball question. Uh, thanks. For that. Uh, it, it's it's very important that this be a physician to physician conversation. And, and and as CMIO, I was the one carrying this message around. It's even better if you can get a CMI CMO on board. And uh, and I think the the recent push for us to make this a system wide initiative rather than a you know onesie twosie. Well, these two clinics and those three clinics agreed uh, is to get the chief medical officer to say. This is a priority from a clinician's standpoint, not that this is a priority from an IT standpoint. This has to be a clinician-driven initiative, and that's much more successful, absolutely. Yeah, very good, you know, very good. I, Go ahead, Homer. I, I, would, I, would, I would really emphasize that, that it needs to be physician-led. Um, and then the other thing I would say is uh, you do need to communicate to all the physicians, but you need to make sure that you don't have one or two vocal oppo opponents uh, derail this because you'll always have one or two physicians that say no over my dead body or no, I didn't go to medical school uh, to write notes uh, for patients. But you need the physician leadership uh, to back you. So when that happens, get out of the way and have the CMO or the clinic director or uh, whoever it is that's the physician lead in, in that module say, no, we are moving forward. And uh, this is a clinical decision that's been made at the organizational level. I think that's a great point. I just want to want to emphasize that, uh, that we don't just want a physician leading this, such as a CMIO. It's almost like any, any affiliation with IT somehow taints the message and the messenger. Um, and so we want the CMIO to get the CMO to really be the proponent that's going to drive this, correct? Yes, yes I agree. Ab absolutely. You need uh, the CMO to be uh, essentially the sponsor, the overall sponsor. And once you convince the organization to move forward <clears throat> in terms of physician leadership, I would say as the CMIO, kind of uh, get, <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> Um, Homer, is it is it possible or have you seen cases where the CMO is unfortunately that individual who wants no part of this? That does happen. And if that if that does happen, uh that's a very significant barrier. And I would say uh that almost makes it impossible to move forward. CT, I'm not sure what you would say. Um, I would agree with that. Uh it, it, I uh, the mistake I made in the past was I would go into large governance meetings of 40 leaders and an, announce this new initiative, and it's very easy, as Homer says, to have one or two uh, um, uh, significant detractors with a lot of passion to sway the entire group, and that's the wrong way to do it, and I've done that, and I'll tell you, don't do it. <laughs> uh, instead, it's important to go to who you perceive to be large influencers within the within the leadership group and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Individual one-on-one -on -one conversations tend to be much more successful. Um, when you can lay out the argument, you can listen carefully to the, all their concerns um, uh, and al allow them to lay out their uh, anxieties and their fears about how this is going to blow things up. And if you can make an arrangement with them one-on-one -on -one ahead of a larger governance meeting to say, you know what, um, I will be there to support your clinic, and if you need to opt out a month later because things are blowing up, which you know for a fact that that won't happen, um, then having them say, you know, I've had that conversation, I have some reassurances that uh, I can I can take things back and revisit it later, then that doesn't tend to derail the larger conversation. But having a CMO on board is crucial, and if they are dead set against it, even after a one-on-one -on -one private meeting, then you've got to put your thinking cap on because that's going to be much, much more more difficult, if not impossible, to move forward. I agree. Very good advice, gentlemen. Uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> look at our first poll now. I'm going to go ahead and 
open it up. You should see that on the right-hand side of your screen in the polling panel. Where do you stand on open notes? Then we'll discuss this. So you have one, this is a single select. Um, obviously from the most engaged to the least. So we have implemented and optimized. You know, we're all good. We have implemented but not yet optimized. We're preparing to launch. We've investigated it and committed. So we're, we, we checked it out and we're going to go forward. We're seriously investigating but not committed yet, and we're just getting acquainted. So if you would mind, um, we'd really appreciate everybody either answering that or um, again, we're not looking to get too, too scientific. If you uh, have a client that's a health system and you know their stand on this, that would be great. Just give us an answer based on where you think um, the health system may be. Uh, all right, we're going to come back to that, so go ahead and answer the poll question. And let's go with CT on this. What are the foundational elements necessary uh, from a culture perspective, staffing, technology, to move forward with open notes? Well, um, I'll say that uh, the technology part is generally not hard anymore. The vast majority of EHRs out there do have portals, and of those, most of them, I believe, do have an open notes setting that you can flip. Um, I know that uh, the EPIC electronic health record that we are using does have that setting, and it's just a matter of a technological flip to say that that's uh, available. There is a little bit of uh, detail work to talk about how you allow docs to opt in or opt out of displaying notes. I think it's important to go after an opt out strategy, that the default is the note is shared. Um, because on the other, because the default setting will, will be accepted the vast majority of time. So right. don't make the mistake of saying that we're going to have doctors opt in because you're going to have about a 5% opt in rate for those who take the additional step of clicking another box to make sure it's shared with the patient. Opting out, I, say, I think, the, the valuable and important way to go forward. Um, in terms of culture, uh, we talked about that uh, just before. Laying the groundwork is crucial um, and may take months or years. <clears throat> Starting with getting buy-in from the very top, from the CMO, from the clinical leadership, and also making sure you speak to those who you anticipate to be significant detractors and, and, uh, um, and making sure you have those private one-on-one -on -one conversations to allow those grievances to be aired prior to going to large governance meetings. I, I'll, I think back to a quote that uh, uh, if any of you have read Machiavelli's The Prince, um, I was told decades ago by one of my mentors that uh, the Machiavelli's book is the, uh, is the handbook for uh, large academic medical centers, and that's how we work. Um, and <laughs> the, my favorite quote from, from this book is that nothing is so difficult as change in a large organization because at best your proponents are lukewarm and your detractors will have all the passion in the world. And having that in mind allows you to work through the culture in detail and, and be careful about moving forward. Very good. Homer, would you like to talk a little bit about this question? Um, yeah, I think the culture is uh, absolutely key, and uh, sponsorship is really important. And so you need the CMO definitely on board, uh, and you need to communicate to the other leaders in the organization. So the CEO should be aware and supportive. If the CEO is not supportive, you know, that, that could be a significant roadblock as well. So I would say the CMO needs to uh, be sort of the chief sponsor leading this. The CEO needs to be aware and supportive. And then uh, once you have that, then you start from the top down uh, with department leaders, uh, chiefs of um, departments, uh, clinic leaders, <clears throat> and uh, move, move uh, all the way down. And then uh, the other um, key thing is to make sure that your vendor is capable of supporting open notes, and uh, some vendors, as, as CT mentioned, are more capable than others, and so you need to work through that and make sure that you've got the support in place uh, to make this successful. Homer, do you find that in most organizations, uh, well, let me ask you, in most organizations, who is driving this? Who is raising the issue and then trying to make it happen? Is it the medical side or is it the, the, the IT side? It's really the technical, uh, I mean, the um, the clinical side. The clinical side really needs to drive this. No, no, I, I know. I, I know that's what needs to happen, but my question is, who usually is bringing up this discussion in the first place? 
Uh, it's usually the CMIO. So the CMIO okay. is the connection between uh, the technical folks and um, and the rest of, and the rest of the organization. And so you need to convince the CMIO, and then the CMIO is sort of the the change agent uh, to work with the CMO and uh, convince the rest of the clinical leadership. Okay, okay, we have someone uh, joining us in the background there, but that's all right, it's live TV. Um, let's go back to our poll question and take a look at our results. Okay, and you should see those results on your right. Um, CT, the interesting, this is very interesting to me, we don't have a huge number, but the percentages are all on the low end in terms of engagement, which surprises me a little bit. Does that surprise you, or is that pretty much where you think the industry is at this point? Um, I, I'm a little surprised by the distribution. It may be just who's able to get on, on, on this call. Um, my perception, at least within the Metro Denver area, is that um, um, many of my sister hospital organizations in Denver are in the investigating and committed um, okay. area, and at least one is in the serious investigating but not committed yet. So I say D and E in my region is, is where we are, um, although having a CMIO to CMIO conversation that we're looking at hosting uh, later this year, we're hoping to move the, the culture along. It is true that as as for your first question, you know, there's so many other competing demands that open notes isn't necessarily, you know, number one. It's not uh it's not on the meaningful use criteria, it's not necessarily top of your, you know, macro uh, criteria. So there's lots of other things folks are, are looking at. So I I'm not terribly surprised by it. Well, and, and also I think uh, perhaps a message for the audience out there is is don't worry, you're not far behind. It's not like everyone else is uh you know, all done and, and finished with this. So, um, you know, everyone seems to be interested, or a lot of people, obviously, you're on the line, you're interested, but uh, investigating. So, um, and perhaps uh, that's that's a, a decent message that don't lose heart, keep working on it and moving forward. All right, let's go to our next question. Um, let's stick with UCT. Uh, can you give us a basic sequence of steps one might take to move forward with open notes? So I'll I'll say that this is a compression of <clears throat> shall we say 15 years of my life trying to get to the point where we are now. But I think this can be really a much shorter timeline for most organizations because the national culture really has shifted in the past 15 years. I'd say you start with physician leadership buy-in, you know, the CMO, the vice president of medical staff, the medical directors of the clinics, and have a theoretical conversation about what do people think about taking this on as an initiative. Um, then we, we move forward with an agreement to pilot open notes in a small number of clinics, uh, one or two. We actually ended up doing seven primary care practices as a pilot group, it's about 30,000 patients, for about uh, six months, and then you gather data from, the, from what happens in those clinics. And surprise, surprise, there's not thousands of phone calls or complaints, there's nearly zero. In fact, for our six, first six months, there were zero complaints or concerns uh, from our patients, and then we had a smattering of patients saying, hey, this is nice, I didn't know I could see my notes. And having that positive PR plus the lack of downside um, issues from those clinics, then you take that data and you go to the rest of your practices, and then that snowballs. And I think what, after, what you do after that is um, you uh, you set a, a certain date, and we actually used our uh, EHR upgrade timeline. So May of 2016 was the time we were doing a version upgrade, and so we used that as our burning platform to say, by the way, when we go to the version upgrade, we're going to be open notes from that point forward. And that was a successful model for us. Does any physician have the, do they have the choice uh, of not sharing a particular note with a particular patient? So our current setting, and this is part of the technology discussion that you need to have ahead of time, is that every clinic is open notes. Uh, right now it's with the exception of mental health, but we're proud to say actually as of the middle of February we will be turning our mental health clinics on with open notes as well. But with the exception of mental health notes, um, every other clinic uh, we had said system-wide we are a transparent organization, we're going to do it. We will allow physicians on an individual note basis to say this particular note I'm not going to share. And, and, and it, 
our current stats, we show that about 0 .0, it's about 0.5 percent of notes actually are hidden uh, based on a physician opting an individual note out. But we don't permit any physician to fully opt out and say, I never show notes. That, right. that does not happen in our organization. Right, right. Homer, uh, your thoughts on the, uh, the basic sequence of steps? Homer, you might have yourself on mute there. Okay. Well, Homer, if you can call back in, that would be great. CT, you are going to carry the weight right now. <laughs> How's good. that sound? All right. Um, okay, next question. And again, we've touched on some of this stuff before, but you can expand on it if you would. What are the key C-suite partnerships necessary to make open notes a success? Obviously, CIO, CMIO, you mentioned CMO. And here's one you may want to uh, tackle. Should the hospital's legal department be or, or counsel be engaged? Yeah. So I, you're, you're right. We have talked about this a little bit. I agree. The CIO, the CMIO, the informatics department needs to be on board, of course. Um, the CMO and medical directors need to be highly engaged and preferably have the CMO be a co-sponsor or the main sponsor of such an initiative. Don't leave behind your nursing staff, the chief nursing officer, uh, any nursing leadership. Uh, oftentimes patient questions come to the nurses, and so you want to make sure that this is not a surprise uh, and make sure that the nurses are on board with it. In our research studies, our nurses are some of the biggest proponents. After they get over the initial shock of what, we're going to do what, um, they understand that when you release notes, patients, when they call with questions, they have very different questions. One of the nurses in one of our clinics said, you know, before in our cardiology practice, patients would call up constantly and say, hey, what did my echocardiogram show? And now what they call in and say is, you know, I see that my echocardiogram ejection fraction improved from 27 to 35 percent, and I read that the digoxin in the doctor's note was the reason for the improvement. Is, is that the digoxin working? So it's a much more sophisticated question patients call with, and the nurses love that from a patient education standpoint. From a legal and compliance and HIM perspective, yes, you need to absolutely have them engaged. Sometimes, I would say most legal and compliance officers understand that there's an open notes initiative, but they want to go back and read their regulations and make sure you're not stepping on any sort of, gee, did you sign a release for this patient? No, no, we don't need to do that if you're releasing it directly to the patient as long as we, do, we track it in the system. So all those technical pieces you do want to not stumble over and have advanced conversations for. And I'll say the one last thing that Potentially, if you have a patient and family-centered care committee or community, please engage them. They are sometimes some of your biggest proponents. We have a 30-member patient, uh, uh, patient committee that's part of our leadership, and they meet on a monthly basis, and they have been asking us for years, hey, CT, you did this research 10 years ago. When are we turning on open notes for our system? And having those cheerleaders in the background, our patients telling us, you know, we've heard of this, and why don't you have it going, can be a very powerful voice to turn around and say to the clinics, your own patients want this. Why are we withholding it? And so that engagement can be very, very powerful. <clears throat> very good. All right, let's go to our next poll question. And we're going to open that for you in one second. Second. Okay. What is your biggest concern around moving forward with open notes if you have one? This is a multi select. So you can select all those that, um, you know, are of concern to you. Uh, physician pushback, patient inquiries, you know, people asking, you know, getting berated, uh, physicians getting berated with uh, questions or the organization. Technical challenges or just too many other things to do right now? So go ahead and answer that question, and then we will review it when you are finished. Next question. Um, and we have Homer back. Hey, Homer. Yes, hello. Sorry, I, um, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> connected. No, you you did the closed note button instead of the open note button. But uh thank you. <laughs> Thanks for getting back. Um well, let's let's jump right in with you. Uh what are some common challenges with instituting open notes and how are they best dealt with? 
Yeah, I, I think one of the main challenges is really position pushback. And um, the key thing to that is to get leadership buy-in up front and then have a good communication to the rest of the organization. So uh, there are a lot of very good communication tools, and along those lines, uh, there's a website around Open Notes. It's opennotes.org uh, that has a tremendous amount of resources, uh, little uh, video snippets, uh, um, a host of uh, research papers that you can use, uh, PowerPoint presentations that you can use to communicate to the rest of the organization. Um, I think the key thing is good communication, um, and one of the things that CT mentioned is that there is <clears throat> no negative effect on physician work life, which is their primary concern, and very significant benefits uh, to patients. So if you can um, get that message out, uh, you can ameliorate the physician pushback. So Homer, you're saying, in, and I think this is a question we have later on, uh, but we could deal with it now. You're saying that on the opennotes.org site, there are a lot of materials, research, physicians love data, right? So if you're trying to convince the CMO or you're ready, you know, you've got that meeting set up and you really want to make your case properly, there are a lot of materials that can be obtained from, from the Open Notes site that you can then bring there, some data, some research, some charts. Yes, that's right. <coughs> uh, not only that, but... Um... If you will contact me or somebody else at the Open Notes uh, organization, we are happy to either send folks out to do a presentation to uh, ah. the organization or to host a WebEx or do a number of things to, to assist an organization in uh, getting involved in Open Notes. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, CT, anything you want to add on this question? Yeah, so I have two two points. One is that uh, we have left-brained and we have left right-brained uh, uh, physicians, and so uh, the data is absolutely key. But really, uh, sometimes data has a difficult time combating stories, right? And so the fears and the stories that folks have in their head. And I have two stories that I think were really powerful that speak to the the positive nature of the open notes. Um, one is that you know the, the one term one of the fears is, gee, I'm going to have to rewrite all my notes with patient-friendly lay language, and I just don't have time for that. And when we ask our patients in our focus groups uh, who are on open notes, they say, don't, don't do that. We very much value what one of my docs called the, the Wall Street Journal version of the record. We don't want a USA Today version of the record. Um, that's a nice to have, but I want to see the, the real guts of what you write. And if there's a bunch of terminology, that's not a problem. I have Google. I can read all night long on acute myocardial infarction. That's really not a problem for me. Um, and in fact, one of our other patients says, and it doesn't mean that I have to look at every progress note. What I have value for is when I go to my next doctor and they didn't receive a fax or they didn't have an intercommunication between, between EHRs and I have no idea what my last doctor said, I, can, I have ownership of being able to deliver that report and be a, be a connector in my own care. That's the big value that patients love. And you just can't do that without open notes. So those are the things that I think we need to communicate, stories, positive stories that patients say, this is why I value you doing this for me. And then one last yeah. thing from a technical okay. perspective that, uh, that is, a, is an, is an under, uh, understated gotcha is that you need to make sure your website makes open notes as visible as possible. Our initial setup for open notes has it hidden under past appointments. And it doesn't say, look here for open notes. It just says past appointments. And so patients don't know to go look for it. And we're in the process of making our website change so that past notes are obviously available and we notify patients that now it's there, you should go look. So that's an important part of the technical piece. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we've all been in a situation, uh, you know, in a hospital or caring for a loved one visiting, and the physician comes in and they're saying a lot of things, and some of them are technical. And what do you have to do if you don't have open notes? You have to remember that, or you have to start jotting notes down, which kind of can sometimes make physicians uncomfortable, or you can take out your phone and record it, which may make them even more uncomfortable. Um, and you get out of there and you're trying to remember what you were told and God forbid you have a, a spouse or someone asking you what you were told. So this really solves a lot of problems. Um, yes. So I'm a big proponent. <laughs> I'm all for it. Um, let's take a look at the poll results um, and we will share those with you now. Uh, we see, Homer, let's look at these results. 
Mm. Very interesting. So uh, you mentioned physician pushback, uh, but I did not think that number one would be too many other things to do. Um, so what are your thoughts on the results you're seeing there? Uh, there are a lot of things to do, especially with meaningful use and macro coming along. Now, the thing that I would say around open notes is it actually helps with um, achieving meaningful use in macro. One of the requirements is to increase the amount of portal use. And what we're finding is that if you do have open notes and you say to the patients, hey, you know, if you sign on to the portal, you can actually look at your doctor's notes. That actually facilitates uh, achieving meaningful use in macro through uh, increasing portal adoption. So I would say it's synergistic uh, with, with those other things. And then uh, certainly around uh, patient engagement and patient-centered care, uh, open notes uh, really helps with that. Now, one of the other things that I would say that we haven't uh, mentioned before is the, um, the fact that uh, patients look at an organization that has open notes favorably, and so if there, are another, if there are a number of provider organizations that are competitive in a marketplace, uh, there's good data now that shows that uh, patients will preferably choose the organization that has open notes versus one that does not. And so I would say all those things are uh, pushing in favor of doing this even though there are a lot of things uh, on, on folks' plates. CT, any thoughts on those results? No, I think, uh, I think that's absolutely right. I think that too many other things to do is certainly a complaint we all have about many parts of our lives. <laughs> but with MIPS and MACRA and trying to drive patient adoption, our, our uh, adoption in some of our best primary care practices, we're running 60 to 80% adoption of patient portal, and a significant part of that is the open notes availability. So that's a sticky place where patients go, oh, part of me is in there, I should go and look. Um, and that's really a pretty attractive piece of getting patients online. Very good. All right. Um, CT, let's stick with you here. Does the Open Notes initiative need to be budgeted for? How can that best be done or estimated? You know, um, it's, I think, less an issue of money than of culture change and the, uh, the, the, the legwork, uh, the shoe, what is it, the shoe leather uh, to get around and talk to people. It's time and effort and leadership meetings. Um, Typically on the, on the IT side, it has more to do with settings changes and not dramatic uh, upgrades and, and systems needed uh, to make these changes. So I, I don't think it's typically a bit budgeted project. It wasn't for us. Homer, you agree? Yeah, I agree. Um, there are uh, minimal uh, budget impacts. Uh, one, one of the impacts is, is really around communication, physician leadership, and then uh, the other thing is, in order to really fully deploy this, um, you need to involve your communications department, patient education, getting the word out to patients, uh, building small tools that inform patients how best to uh, get access to to the notes and, and to answer questions. And then there may be a little bit of increased staffing with the end user help desk around the patient portal, but it's all on the margin. There's not, there's not a significant uh, budgetary uh, um, allocation that's needed specifically for this. Very good. <clears throat> all right, Homer, let's stick. Well, we, we touched on this. What resources are available to organizations from Open Notes to help with the launch and maintenance of the program? Homer, anything in addition to the website you mentioned? Um, the other thing that I would say is that we have a list of organizations that have implemented open notes and implemented it in different ways. And so if uh, there's a particular organization that wants to implement uh, open notes in a certain way, for instance, for mental health, we have other peer organizations that we can turn to that, uh, that can help. Often it's useful for an organization to talk to another organization who's been through this process to get their uh, experience and advice. And so we have a list of organizations that have implemented open notes in different ways that we can turn to and, um, and provide that connection. And so I would say that that's one of the important uh, things that, that we can also provide. And then the other thing that we're starting to do is we're starting to create uh, community-based consortiums. And so there's uh, one in Portland, <clears throat> Oregon, that's been very successful. We're starting one in uh, Wisconsin, and then uh, for folks that are interested in starting a community-based consortium, uh, we can certainly provide advice and, and help with that. 
sometimes it's helpful to implement open nodes as a community, <clears throat> and that way everybody's involved and they're supporting each other and moving uh, forward. Very good. All right. Um, CT, uh, and you mentioned some lessons learned along the way. Uh, in all of your experiences so far, what have been the biggest improvements in the program's best practices since its launch? And what areas are you currently targeting for change? So I, I'd say that uh, if you're looking to move forward on this, having a pilot clinic for a fixed period of time, um, marketing that heavily, and then really rip off the Band-Aid. I think it's a mistake to say, well, I'll do two clinics this time and then maybe another three clinics. Um, you know, in, in a previous uh, decade when we were doing our EHR deployment, we were on, a, I think, a 12-year deployment schedule if you're doing two to three clinics at a time. It's worth doing the Band-Aid ripped off. At, you know, once you have enough pilot data or you convinced the leadership to move, uh, try to make a, a big step uh, create a sort of a burning platform, make a big marketing push around it, and just get it done. I think that's that's the lesson there. Um, in terms of where we're going further, uh, we're launching Medical Health Notes next month. Uh, we're, we think that Beth Israel and others have done some really nice work in that area. We're planning on going to inpatient open notes. We actually have one pilot unit starting in oncology and in general medicine uh, this month, and we're going to be studying that for the next several months. And then we're moving towards an idea of shared notes. I know that Beth Israel is doing this as well, where patients can contribute to some sections of their chart so that they feel like their, their documentation is part of their medical record as well. So this collaboration tool can be pushed in so many interesting, innovative ways. We're looking forward to participating in that. Very good. Homer, your thoughts on that or any final thoughts? Um, <clears throat> well, I think one thing to emphasize is uh, something that CT brought up, uh, which is our advice is not to allow individual physicians to um, to opt in. Uh, right. In other words, you could implement open notes by saying, hey, this functionality is available. It's up to you whether you want to turn it on and not allow it, not allow individual physicians to make the decision, but to do it as an organizational policy, to say we're an open notes organization, we're going to open the medical record to uh, to patients. The other thing I would mention is the thing that CT also brought up, which is the inpatient side, and I think there's a significant benefit to um, allowing patients to see at least part of the inpatient medical record, and particularly the discharge summary. There are a lot of issues with uh, with uh, patient transitions, and if the discharge summary is available to patients, uh, I think that will significantly improve the transition process. So I would emphasize that piece of the inpatient medical record as well. CT, let me ask you one final question that came to mind. Um, does turning on open notes uh, cause physicians and nurses to write better notes? Uh, I think the potential is there. This is a journey that we're all on. Um, some of the fears that physicians have about open notes is, well, I'm going to stop writing sensitive things in the record. And we know for a fact that um, if we can teach docs to not be pejorative, you know, to talk about that smelly, non-compliant patient is back again. You know, in my training, I've seen those notes as scribbled on paper in decades past. I think we're past that. And if we give docs, as we do in a little white paper, you know, here are the things that you might be afraid of sharing with the patient, and here are the outcomes of uh, other organizations that have shared it, and you could write it in this way, and patients take that as a partnership. You talk about obesity, you could mention the body mass index instead. Or mm -hmm. and actually there's stories of patients saying that when I saw morbid obesity in the chart, I took it more seriously because it's there in black and white. So we shouldn't be overly afraid uh, of, of doing better with our documentation and having it be more valuable to our patients. All right, very good. Well, again, we have this open for questions, uh, so if you have any, send them in. But as we see if, as we wait to see if any questions come in, we have a special treat for you today. We are going to get a special song um, played by Dr. C.T. Lin with the ukulele, and I believe this is an Open Notes associated song, Dr. Lin? Uh, that's right. All right. Well, we'd love to hear it. Why don't you go for it? Okay. So with, uh, with uh, my apologies to those who are professional singers who actually know how to carry a tune, here we go. Thank you. 
Doc Prudence. Won't you come explain? Doc Prudence. Can you tell me again? The words you write, I have no clue. Why put it away? Why hide it from you, Doc Prudence? Won't you tell me again, Doc Prudence? Open up your notes, Doc Prudence. Let us see your quotes. The wind is low, the birds will sing that your notes are part of everything, Doc Prudence. Won't you open up your notes, Doc Prudence? Let the patients read Doc Prudence You just might succeed Your words will be A ray of light So let us see All your insight Doc Prudence, won't you let the patients read? Doc Prudence, you've opened up your notes. Doc Prudence, I can even see deoxy ribose the words you write I can google to you're sharing with me but you're still my guru Doc Prudence you made me a partner with what you wrote Very good. Very, very good. Awesome. Thank you so much, CT. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, that is about all we had time for today. Uh, When when you close out your WebEx window, please take a minute to answer our post-event survey. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Homer Chin and Dr. C.T. Lin, so much for joining us and sharing all this great information, hopefully helping people down the Open Notes Road. As far as continuing education goes, attending our events gets you one uh, CEU for the CHIME CHCIO program, so let CHIME know you were here. And if, you, if you've asked us to do so, we will. You also have a certificate of attendance as the final slide in this deck, which you can use towards any other program where you might get CEUs. You'll receive an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel, and you can contact Nancy Wilcox if you would like us to produce a webinar panel on the topic of your choice. And of course, go to our website to view our robust upcoming schedule of events. So once again, I want to thank Homer, CT, our audience. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.